talk about uh, knowing about a crash retrieval. Do you? When was the first time that you were aware of a crash, uh, either Roswell or any other crashes here in the United States? Well, the first I knew about was about around the beginning of '47 when I came back from World War II, and I had uh, in intelligence sources there was uh, reports that said that UFOs had crashed in different parts of the world and they were buzzing our planes and so forth. I know about them, but I didn't know about the Roswell crash then. I learned about the Roswell crash when I went, I was stationed in Fort Raleigh, Kansas, and I was uh, I was the duty officer that night. That meant I was in charge of the security of the whole area, including the inspection of the guards, every place where they were. So I went around about two or three in the morning to the veterinarian area, because we had horses at Fort Raleigh. And one of the sergeants that I knew was a sergeant of the guard. I used to bowl with him. And uh, I told him, Sergeant, how's everything going? I, they told me at headquarters that this area was very secure. He said, yes, come on. Colonel. He said, I want to show you something. So he took me back in the back room, and there was five crates. They looked like crates there. Lifted up the tarpaulin on one I did, and here's this body there. At first I thought it was maybe a child, because it was only about five feet, you know, shorter than five feet. It looked to me, and it was falling in fluid. And then I took a good look at it, and this lasted about 10 or 15 seconds only. And I figured, what is that? And the stomach sort of turned. But that was usual, because in combat, when you see people killed, your stomach sort of turned. But you have to recover fast, especially if you're an officer in command, you have to keep going. I did the same thing that night at Fort Raleigh. And I covered it up, and I told him, Sergeant, be careful, this is very careful, I don't want you to get in trouble, get out of here. And uh, I'm not going to put it in my report at all. Okay, what, what did this, can you describe what this, um, this body that you saw? Yes, I'll describe it. Uh, it looked like it had spindly, sort of legs were not big legs, it was sort of spindly, the arms were sort of, I saw four fingers, I saw no thumb. And, uh, uh, the, the chest was small, sort of, and the skin looked sort of grayish color. And then the head was a large for the proportion of the body. Not real big now, but large. And the eyes were both slanted, sort of. And they had about a half a filament on them. Which, and uh, no nose, no ears, no mouth. Just slits. So I covered it up and I figured to myself when I was walking away and outside, I better not say anything about this. I don't know what it is. I have no idea what it is. So I'll, I figured I'll operate in the intelligence manner. Hold this in reserve, put it up here someplace or back here. Maybe in the future I'll get some cooperation and be able to evaluate this. But not at the moment. I don't know what it is. So I promptly put him back my head and forgot about it. Okay. Then ten years later, I was at Fort Riley, I was at White Sands, commanding the missile range. Well, at the White House, I kept getting reports. But none of them tied in definitely to this experience. So, at the of White Sands, my own radars were picking things up, items going in the air, three or four thousand miles an hour. And I had radars, pencil beam, which would lock on the targets. They were good radars for the day. And I was the only, my battalion, the only one had radars that could read altitude. The Air Force couldn't even in those days. These were modern Nike radars. And in the later stages, to show you how important it was, I started getting atomic warheads. So I figured there's something up there traveling with this speed. What are they? So, like a good soldier, I reported to higher headquarters. And some back was, forget it, we want to nurse it. Don't report anymore. Well, if they want it that way, good. Then when I get reports in the future, I tell the boy, deliver the tapes to me. Because we had tapes that would record the whole foreign sequence. And I checked the tape and I figured, well, this is accurate. What the boy said was this true. There's something up there flying around that's beyond our technical capability. We have nothing to go three, four thousand miles an hour and break the lock that quick on a, on a radar. Especially these radars which locked on the targets. But how did you know, how do you go back to seeing what you saw and relating it to Roswell? 
Well, let me tell you all later now. Let me continue on this. So a few years later, I uh, had some experience in this that the, there were some, some like they call extraterrestrials. So I think maybe this was one of them. Then when I, when the General Trudeau reported him in the Pentagon, and he told me before he was going to send for me as soon as I got back, because I commanded the range of the missile in and New Mexico, and I was Inspector General of the Army, my second tour of there. So I reported to him, saluted him, he said, you aboard, Phil? I told him, yes, sir. He said, good, watch things for me, the rest don't understand. And that's the only orders he ever gave me, because that's all I did in the White House staff, he sent me there. So he called me in one day, he said, uh, I'm going to make you chief of the Point of North Division, and you're going to inherit a three-drawer file. I want you to go through that file and look what's there, and you give me a program and tell me what you think they are. So I take this file in my office, downstairs from his office, the second floor in the Pentagon, and I open it up and I start finding the, this material, which he called later, of course, it was junk. Well, and there was a bunch of wires, which I didn't even know what they were, which were emitting colors. I didn't even know if they were wires. I had this chip, <coughs> this integrated circuit, a laser instrument. They could do like some of the fine cuttings that they said in manual manipulations. And I had uh, also fiber optics, or something that uh, uh, I had those. And uh, no, we called them, uh, <coughs> we, we started that because one of my, and I had reports on autopsy that performed at Walter Reed on our lab, which we financed at Walter Reed. And when I read that, it matched with what I saw at Fort Riley 14 years before. The whole autopsy was similar to what I had seen. So then I started putting two and two together. And gradually these items would start putting, then the general called me in and said, work out a program. Find scientists and are working on these things and shove them in there. I told them, but General, I have to study these things a little bit because really, I told them, I'm not that bright. I don't know what these, a lot of these things are, but they're important. He said, well, Phil, they are important. Give me a program what they are. So asking questions, talking to industry, talking to scientists, I finally came up with a program for the General, which he was satisfied with. He said, okay, start it working. You're in charge and keep me informed. So I started getting these things, and I had some idea. I wasn't sure what the chip was. Integrated circuit in those days, a little bit on me. So I started talking to people, and I figured, well, they did. this must be important. So that went, the write-up, I mean, went to Bell Lab. Then I had an instrument, also, which I didn't discuss in the book. And like a human, I figured, well, it won't come on, it look like a little flashlight. The battery must be dead. Of course, there was no battery in it. That was thickening in these were this world's terms. So one day I went down to our lab at Belvoir, and uh, I told uh, the boys there I know them very well. We went in the lab and a little bit of radiation. They were doing some work on radiation that damn thing came on. It was an instrument, and you run over the body, it would blink, and it had two dials on it, which lit up. But another instrument. But beyond that, the, getting back to the body, so when I read the autopsy, I went to the general, I told him, General, I've seen one of these. And I started describing it to him. He said, put it all on paper, Phil, and give it to me. So we put it down, I put it on paper, and he said, I got to Phil, he said, what do we got, what are we up against here? I told him, I don't know, he was a very religious guy. He used to go to a word preach at Loyola. And also, uh, he was the kind of man that took his helmet off and got a sergeant to tell him to be Hill, and I went to with his men. So when I start putting all this on the extraterrestrial together, we finally gave it a name. I told him, it looks like, you know, these are clones. And so the name came out, Extra, Extraterrestrial Biological Entity. You know, that's what we figured they were. We better describe it. We never used the, the letters ET. There was no such thing. You said that they looked like clones. How they were clones. Not look like clones. They were clones. We figured that they were created by some some other intellect. And we also came to the decision that they were made to 
specifically to travel in space. Because we knew even in those days that man could not travel in space. His bones are affected, his muscles are affected, his brain is affected. Man cannot travel in space. So we came to the conclusion these creatures, whatever they are, are made to travel in space. And gradually through what the work we did, we found out that this integrated with the flying saucer and really because most of the failures of making flying saucers were, were the guidance system. That this creature was also the guidance system, was part of the engine of the flying saucer. And gradually I got into a lymphatic system, the lungs, and that thing on the movie people asked me, I thought well, there was some truth to that, because they pulled out an eyelid, and no one knew about that eyelid. That eyelid was a light gatherer, so they could see in the dark. They had a third eyelid. You mean the uh, the autopsy film? Yeah. No, the autopsy that I had said about the third eyelid, mm -hmm. and this autopsy was on TV. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you re see, but they reached over and pulled an eyelid out. Mm -hmm. Now no one knew about that, mm -hmm. and people have asked me what do you think of it. And well, I have to give it some credibility because I saw three things on there which people don't know about. Mm -hmm. Now only I know about them because of the, the autopsy, and I've seen the creature. Now the creature you saw at Fort Riley. Yeah. Did you ever discover where that thing? Yes. Uh, the sergeant asked, you know, sergeants to talk to the drivers. Mm -hmm. The drivers told him that this thing came from an airfield in New Mexico and was going to Wright Patterson. Mm -hmm. The sergeant told me that the drivers of the four vehicles told him that. Mm -hmm. So that's where I knew where they were. Where they so, came from, where they were. So the airfield we're referring to is Roswell. The 509? No, I wouldn't call it Roswell, but I knew about the 509, mm -hmm. the, 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 the atomic weapons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I figured, then I started looking in other papers and I, I found the uh, the references of the crash in Roswell and I figured, well, it had to come from there. What, so were the, the, what were the three things? You said the eyelid was one, the lens. What were the other two? The brain. It had four lobes in it, different from ours. And the third thing? The, the other thing were the striated muscles be able to travel in space. And were you able to see any of that in the autopsy film? Well, n no, I didn't have an autopsy film. No, the autopsy film, film shown on TV. Yes, they had it in, they had it in a sort of a container, and the brain was in there. And it looked like the one that was described in these documents I had. I, I, I want to get back to, to the crashes. If you were, did you see, you, you talk in your book of a number of different crash sites throughout the world. I'm, I'm more interested in, in 1947, around that period of time. Were you privy to any other crash sites in Arizona, New Mexico? I was privy to the St. Augustine crash. And there was another crash right down in Mexico. There were three crashes I was privy of in this area. And of course, I didn't keep track of those because I tell all the people I ask them, did you see the UFO? I tell them, I'm not interested in seeing the UFO. I'm interested in what's inside that UFO. That St. Saint, Saint Augustine crash, could that have been crashed at Socorro instead of St. Augustine in that area? No, it wasn't Socorro. It was down St. Augustine. Because what I did, I got a map, and Roswell came through my area, through Trinity site, and kept on, keeps on going and to the St. Augustine area. Okay. I where my, my headquarters of the Red Canyon Range at the time was the northeast portion on 280 there at White Sands. That's where I was located. There was a crash purported to happen in White Sands itself in 1948, in September of 1948. There was some talk about uh, something down at Kirkman or Hallam in that area. I never know about that. So you never had really a need to know until after a period of time had passed until the general gave you orders to look at this junk and then you looked at the archive. Exactly. Even at the White House, I used to get reports because I had all the clearances. I didn't have what you call a need to know. I had all the clearances. So I was, the documents were available to me to look at and read. I had crypto clearance, I had NSA clearance, satellite clearance. I had all those clearances. In fact, the general told me I want you to have every clearance that I have. The people that were aware of these and recovered them, did they feel that there was a, 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 an international, worldwide threat to our safety? No, I never got recovered like that. We made our decision in 
right in the Army, in R&D, that there was a threat to our safety. Because we had, we kept track of a lot of the incidents that happened. And they were over, uh, over the incidents. They did, they wrecked some of our planes. They, at Valstrom Air Force Base, they knocked out the guidance system of every missile, the same item they knocked out. The Germans used to do this to us in Europe. When we overran the place and we overran the factory, they would take us and say, if they couldn't destroy it moving too fast, they would take the same part of every machine so that you couldn't cannibalize them. And this was the same thing. I'm going to change the shot. Okay. And I'm gonna, she's going to change the shot real quick. And then I'm going to ask this question. In any of the recovered craft that you were aware of, being in the Army, were there any weapons And are you, when you're ready? Go ahead. I'm okay. When there, were, when any of the crashes occurred, and you were in R and D, were there any weaponry found on these crafts? Were there any weapons that were? No. The damage was caused by electromagnetism in those those crafts. No weapon. We came across no weapons. The laser, we came across, but it wasn't exactly a weapon. It was a cutting tool, like it. They had no offensive weapons that you could find. Not that we could find, but the damage was caused. We knew this. Okay, cool. could you could you state that there was no weapons as we saw in the flying saucers, but the weapon that they did have was electromagnetic type weapons, which could knock out our guidance system, knock out our missiles. In fact, Von Braun even said that uh, they threw our missiles off a trajectory. A strong electromagnetic influence from that, because I think this was our guidance system, could knock off, knock out our install our missiles, our minimum missiles, which were our deterrent, knockout guide systems. And in fact, uh, we had a, some reports from uh, Russia, the Bokonar, the Cosmodrome. They flew over 14 seconds and all our towers fell apart. And later, I discussed this same issue, who was the expert on that, with Wilbur Smith, the Canadian genius. And he told me about atomic binding coming loose. And it's cut, it comes in pillars and they get magnetically charged. Now, if you remember the Roswell thing, Roswell said the night before, the night that happened, there were lightning storms, and they kept hitting in one spot. Huh. I asked Wilbur Smith about it. He said, chances are that these moving pillars, which he said would also cause fires, charged this pillar up so hard, he said that the plane landing committed would disintegrate it. And he said, I think that that thing was so charged up that uh, they came through their gate and when they hit it they were surprised and they crashed. I have two more questions. Okay. Um, there, I've been doing a lot of investigation in the field of crash retrievals and Dorothy Kilgallen's name keeps coming up. She was also involved in the Ruby uh, case. Did you ever have a chance to meet Dorothy Kilgallen? No, I never did. I never knew her. I met a lot of them. Reporters and like Edith, Edith Roosevelt is a columnist. I met her, and I know people. I never met Dorothy Kilgallen. I'm familiar with the story about Dorothy. Her demise is sort of questionable because of that. Okay. No, I never did meet her, unfortunately. I wish I would have. And the last question that I want to ask um, uh, there's, you know, besides the ETs coming here, do you are you privy to any information about? abduction cases. Is it the ETs that are still coming to this planet that are abduction or do you yeah, have any idea? That was part of one of the things that we held against them. Could you, could you yeah, say that? About the abductions, that was one of the things that we said that you're mistreating our people and one of the overt acts that we thought that they were doing. Now we never got into abductions in the Army because after all our primary mission was the competitive edge of the Army and number one weapons. And we decided that this was not our area of abductions. We'd leave that to psychologists and medical people. People were trained in that in the other services, like the Surgeon General. And that wasn't really our area to look into. So we watched it. Yes, we had records and all these, and I read a lot of them. And I thought there was a lot to it. But uh, we had our hands full in what we were doing, like it was in a book. And we never got into that because we figured that was a whole area Beyond us, we weren't trained for that, really. And we couldn't make any...
most of them we thought because the descriptions those people gave and some of those things and I still know this the descriptions they gave of the extraterrestrials match us which they don't know about it never got out and we can relocate to another place right so because um, no, it's all right. Go ahead. Okay, you got an old day. I don't want. I don't want the kids. No, not the kids. Okay. They, they don't all right. Well, ask. Go ahead. And can you ask? And then I want to get Bill. Okay. So if you got one more. Could y'all change? Okay. It's been it's been 50 years since the Roswell crash, um, and you've already kind of described the the mind of the military being exposed to this kind of weapons potential. Um, we call it the competitive edge of the army. Exactly, and that's what I want to talk about. Let's bring this up to date. Is do well, okay? I'll just ask it. Do we have have we developed our own arsenal or fleet or, or, or uh, flight command of flying discs? Does does the United States military possess its own no. flying disc technology? Well, I think one of the reasons we failed in flying disc technology. We weren't sure of the propulsion system or the guide system. If you remember, the, uh, and there's talk about the Coanda mm -hmm. flight. Coanda, he flew a flying saucer and got it up in the air and it crashed. He didn't have the guidance system. And we, uh, well, I no, excuse me, we're, that was one, of, one that we designed or one that no, we had that captured? No, described in Europe. Mm -hmm. yeah, he was, and this thing talks about the Coanda effect. Mm -hmm. It's a color sort of. Was it, was it one of ours that we were trying no, to was, test, no, or was it, it wasn't, captured? It wasn't ours. Okay. Now, we did thought experiments, and I know about on fine saucers, the Avro one, for example. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, we hadn't perfected the propulsion system or the guide system, and I think the reason for that because the extraterrestrial himself is the guidance system, and we never figured on that. We never thought that it. An extraterrestrial, a humanoid, could be a guidance system in himself. Are we still trying to develop this, or are we just saying, well, we can't I, I, do it, so we I just... I wish I knew. Okay. I, in the, I don't know. Okay. I can't tell you that. Because once I left, a lot of times I talk to friends of mine that are in, and they, they tell me things, you know. But I can't set it down on paper like anything that I've worked on myself, yeah. like here. Thank no, you. I didn't work on that. But we, unfortunately, I wish I did know. Were you ever at Camp Stewart? No. In in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, or in Georgia? So. Oh, I stopped there, but no, no staying there. Did you ever run across a gentleman named Lieutenant Colonel uh, Thomas M. Cheney, a surgeon? No, I, I can't place that name. That's all I have. Malmstrom. That was in 1975 when they knocked out. I think it was. Yeah. They knocked out the guidance system. Right. The Loring, system. Malmstrom, yeah. and I. We changed. Wordsmith. Yeah. That cost quite a. Yeah. Oh yeah. 97. Uh, 75 was a big year. Yeah.